Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Virtual Mary Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Chris Agard, and I'm one of your three Ath Fellows. In 1927, the Ford Motor Company attempted to establish rubber plantations on the Tapajos River, a primary tributary of the Amazon rainforest. Ninety years after, his fail after Henry Ford's failure in the jungle, the documentary Beyond Fortlandia presents an environmental account of this period. The film addresses the recent transition from failed rubber to successful soybean cultivation for export and its implications for land usage, leading to such questions as, what were the actual economic reasons for Ford to venture hundreds of miles through the Amazon jungle for a home for his project? Why did he want to transplant a slice of 20th century civilization into the middle of the Amazon rainforest? Was rubber cultivation his only goal? What are the ecological implications for a staggering number of fish, insects, plants, animals, and the biome in general of this venture now, 90 years later? And how did Ford, it's Ford's attempt to convert the lush, naturally abundant Brazilian landscape into industrial scale agriculture foreshadow today's destruction of the rainforest? Beyond Fordlandia was written, directed, and produced by tonight's guest speaker. Marcos Colon received his PhD in Spanish and Portuguese cultural studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2019. His research focuses on Brazilian liter literary and cultural studies with a particular emphasis on representations of the Amazon in the 20th, in 20th and 21st century Brazilian literature and film. He has produced and directed two documentary films that represent diverse perspectives on humanity's complex relations with the natural world. Cologne's scholarship uses the post-rubber era in the Brazilian Amazon as a springboard for re-envisioning the region in a relational way, challenging hegemonic representations of the tropics in literature and culture. He is also the editor and creator of Amazonia Latitude, a digital environmental magazine. Dr. Cologne's Athenaeum presentation and the screening of the movie are organized in commemoration of Earth Day. Using the Q&A function, we will accept questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send in a question, please state your affiliation with the college. Student, faculty, parent, alumni, friend. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marcos Colon to the Athenaeum. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Chris Agar, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you for, um, I wanted to say, uh, thank you for Professor uh, Priya Juna that um, you know, invited me to this event today. Thank you for Professor also Sarah, which I promise that I'm not gonna mispronounce her name uh, for this wonderful invitation. It's a pleasure, it's an honor to be here and to, to be with all of you. And um, well, we hope to have a wonderful talk and a wonderful conversation here um, and get to know a little bit more about this, uh, this nice guy, Ford. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Marcos, would you mind if I just shared the, um, the trailer for the film to get us started? To yes, of please. Me? Okay, yes. let me do that. Among the present-day pioneers of the Amazon who are lighting the way for others to follow is Henry Ford. I think the first thing that inspired him was to have a reliable supply of relatively cheap rubber. By the 1920s, they, the Ford Motor Company controlled pretty much every other natural resource that went into making Ford cars. The ideal is always to find means of spreading the results of scientific achievement more widely on the land.
Amazônia é a última página ainda a escrever do Gênesis. This is such a remarkable film, and we are so thrilled to have you with us here today, Marcos. I mean, it's just the, one of the most powerful and beautiful films I've seen this year, for sure. Um, uh, and I thought that since today is Earth Day, um, and a few year, and a few days ago, Brazil celebrated on April 19th, the uh, Dia do Índio, or the Indigenous Peoples Day, I think it might be fitting to start with a question about what can we learn from indigenous peoples about the earth or the environment? What do we need to hear about what's happening today in Amazonia from the perspectives of indigenous peoples? Well, Sarah, um, and once again, I wanted to thank you for this wonderful reception. Uh, I would like to start up by dedicating this time, this conversation to all the indigenous people, um, all the riparians, all the communities in the Amazon that are now in this very moment that we are talking, facing the most difficult times um, and doing to the COVID, doing to the political authoritarian regime that we have been in place right now. And I also wanted to dedicate this conversation also to the memory of my dear friend, uh, Lilo Clareto, that happened to pass away yesterday Lilo was um, a wonderful photographer who works in, in, in Brazil. Um, he, he was living in Altamira, in the middle of the Amazonia. And it happened that in November, uh, February 20th, I spoke to him for the last time. And uh, he was in a mission to do a photo project. And a couple of days later, he came back and was intubated. And he died yesterday. Lilo has been... Um, advocating for the indigenous people, advocating for the Xingu people, the river who lives in Belo Monte. Uh, I want to dedicate this conversation uh, to all these people. We have more than a hundred, uh, more than a thousand indigenous already dead due to the COVID uh, in, in Brazil. So I wanted to, to honor this, dedicate this talk to, to their memories. Uh, to answer your question, Sarah, um, I think that um, there is so many things that indigenous people can, can really um, teach us. But I think that first of all, we, we need to understand, um, I would say uh, where we are as um, I would say understanding who are they? <laughs> because sometimes there is a difficulty between, I wanted to see indigenous based on what I think they are, but not what they really are. <laughs> You know, and that's, I think, that's the first thing that we should have in consideration. When you would look to them the way they, they are, we're not going to see um, um, them in, as a postcard, as I used to say. So I think what they can learn, what we can learn from them. I think we can learn a different way of appreciation of, uh, uh, um, I would say, uh, appreciation of our, I mean, our environment, our appreciation, our surroundings. But I think more important, more than appreciation, I think the indigenous can teach us really how uh, we have been uh, living in this particular mode that we are right now. Why, I, I think the question is, Sarah, is why the indigenous mode or the indigenous way of living, uh, it's so um, impacted to us, where they really are, uh, why we, when you look to the indigenous peoples, we are thinking, uh, I mean, why they are there, we feel this distance, because I think we create some uh, this separation, these divisions of to see us and them. And I think um, when you start to eliminate those uh, detours and those kind of like, a, I think we start to have pay attention in who are they. So they are people the same way that I am. Um, I, I wanted to think, uh, to, think to, to ask your, your, the, everyone that are listening to us to think about one little thing that I used to do as an analogy. If I, ask you, if I ask you, let's say, if I ask you, you know, anyone here, what do you want to, what do you think you need to be happy? 
And you might think for a few seconds, you might say, mm, I need a nice car. Hmm. I need a nice house. <laughs> or maybe I think we might say, I need a nice, I need to be healthy, especially in this time of COVID. <laughs> uh, and I ask you, uh, what do you think the indigenous people need to be happy? My answer is that they need the same thing that we need. So they need you know, to be respect, they need to have the territory, they need to have their land, they need to have healthy, they need to have, I mean, the houses, <laughs> I mean, what they need to survive. And I think uh, what we learned throughout this process is that historical process I mean in here, is that uh, throughout history, indigenous always was looking at, uh, you know, in a down on, you know, we do not look to them as, as a, as a channel of knowledge, as a channel of uh, making us to understand how can we relationship with one another? How can a relationship with our environmental in itself? So another question that I wanna ask you, pose to you. Uh, I was filming recent, a um, few years ago, I was filming in the indigenous Zoe community. The Zoe community is an indigenous population about 318 members right now in Brazil. And when I was there, the, the Zoe, they, they only eat, uh, they eat like castanha and they eat monkeys and they go for hunting. When they go for hunting, do you know, uh, if they have to kill the monkey in the first arrow, if they sh you know, shoot the, the monkey and the monkey fall and they stay like, and do not die, they take the little monkey as a pet and they, treat him and don't eat him because he didn't die. So they have over there, they have a lot of like small animals that are treated as a pets because they do not kill them. They do not eat them because they do not, was killed in the first arrow, in the first shot. And it's for me, it's a very important example how they respect, you know, the environment. So because what they think is that they said that if they eat the monkey, the spirit of the monkey come to them. And what we can learn from this, Sarah, is that there is a relationship there and there is a respect. And I think what the indigenous people can teach us, they really can teach us how to respect not only our, each other, but also can respect our environment and this relationship that we have with our environment. And I think that among so many things, just last, last month, uh, there is a disappearing of one, uh, the last indigenous for a, a group called Juma, he died. Actually, the New York Times published uh, a piece uh, uh, with uh, Eliane Brum, you know, my dear colleague published. And Lilo Clareto actually was working with Eliane Brum back in Altamira. And um, so this last, this last uh, indigenous, died and with him, the entire history, the entire culture of his people. So what we lose there, we lose our entire diversity of possibilities of different ways of looking and see, appreciate others. I think the other way that we can see the question that you, is that with the indigenous people, we can learn how to respect, but also how can we appreciate. And you can see the world through different lens because we live in a world, as Ayutu Krenak used to say, which is a monotone world, and sounds like we are daltonic. What the indigenous allowed us is to, to see different colors and shades and of possibilities. Another thing that indigenous people can really teach us is when you think about the Amazon, when you think about the indigenous peoples, we, we see a diversity. And the word diversity is very important because when you remove diversity, you remove life. So it's very important here to understand that what is the battle that we have right now is a battle of narratives. Not only in Brazil, here in the United States, if you wanna, if you wanna see the same situation, the same, the indigenous peoples, I, I'm reading now a book called The Black Elk. I mean, it's a 600 page book, but it's a, I, which talks about this visionary indigenous leader here in the United States. 
which it, which describe how many of them were killed and decimated. And, and, but when we kill them, we kill diversity, you kill life. So uh, what we can learn, Sarah, I think we, there is a array, array of possibilities of learning. But I think I, I could say that in, you know, this key ones, I think we can learn the way of respect each other, interact with our own environment. Um, I, I was mentioned this simple example that how the, they go for a hunting and they don't eat a monkey simply because the fact that they think they, they, they did not die if they eat them, they be spirit. For me, this is one of the most powerful example. I carry this with me because show not only the respect for the non-humans, but also uh, our respect with themselves as well. I mean, with the environment. And um, I think that that's what we, we need to appreciate that when you, when you look to them, you, you see other possibles, other possibilities of seeing our surroundings, other possibilities to relate to each other. And I think the battle now is a narrative battle. I don't like this idea of narratives better because we, we live in there right now. Yeah. And, but that when we think the other, uh, you know, as something out there, when you look to the, to the fires, we probably heard on the news, the fires in California over there, but I mean, I'm talking about the fires in the Amazon. We, in the Amazon, we talk about oh, the headlines, fire in the Amazon, but sometimes we forgot to mention that there is people that live there. You know, and those indigenous peoples, they are they are, they are fighting to protect the region, to protect their culture, the legacy. But they are fighting now not only for their life, their survival in the middle of the COVID. More than a thousand has been died. But I think we we need to fight for them. We need to learn from them, because they have been fighting for about five hundred years in Brazil. And there is, as Ayuto Kranak said once to me, he said, Marcos. The indigenous people has been fighting for more than 500 years. I mean, will our generation be able to continue to fight for as we have been fighting? I think they have shown us the endurance, has shown the perseverance to fight against the odds, uh, to fight against a government. So I think we can learn a lot um, because they're fighting for their sort of own survival and their, their own, the survival of their people. Yeah. I, think, I don't know if I answered, but I think. No, you absolutely did. And I want to switch now to thinking about um, something very uh, on the opposite end of this and uh -huh. the, some of the other voices that you exposed and some of the problems that many people in the Amazon are facing now with soy production. Um, and in particular, we hear like one soy farmer talking about the importance or perhaps the inevit inevitability of soy farms or similar forms of agribusiness in the Amazon. And I'm just gonna show a quick click, clip from your, um, from your film that, that focuses on that point here. During the 2016-2017 harvest, Brazil exported 63.5 million tons of soybeans, ranking at first in the world, followed by the United States which exported 58.5 million tons. Brazil ranks first, but its success has been at the expense of the Amazon rainforest. While US producers have run out of land, Brazil has millions of acres of Amazon jungle that still could be cleared. When the boom of the price of the soil in the market, the soja came up from the north to the north. It came from the Rio Grande do Sul, Paraná, Aí entrou no, no, no Cerrado de Goiás, Mato Grosso, e aí, já no início de, de, deste século, viu que era preciso entrar na Amazônia, porque o Brasil precisava vender e faturar. O, o extrativismo da monocultura. O senhor acha que essa, esse desflorestamento é, é legal, isso é normal? O soja? Você destruir a floresta para plantar soja, o senhor acha que isso é legal? Deve de ser feito. Uh -huh. Tem que ter. Atrás da soja. Depois da soja vem o milho, uh -huh. lá vem muito feijão uh -huh. e outras coisas que são plantadas. Então ninguém suma isso, que é só soja. O soja é dinheiro garantido uh -huh. e vai circular a ria. Uh -huh. Vai para fora, mas vai circular a ria. Que benefícios a soja trouxe? Se é que trouxe algum? 
So I'm wondering about this guy and how, you know, how can he justify soy production and the further development of agribusiness without any concern for the environment? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the interesting thing, uh, Sarah, it's to, um, I, would, I want to digress a little bit is how, I, how do I get to him? You know? um, because I think this is, um, it's a very interesting, um, the, this, the, the whole process of making Ford Land was a very, um, it's a very difficult process in the sense that I was lucky to be there in this middle of this, this, this situation. And then when the, I noticed that um, the Ford Landa uh, in Belterra, the cities that Ford built in the Amazon were pretty much, you know, occupied by the soybean industry. And I had the opportunity, as you saw, I interview a lot of people, but this particular guy was by lucky because I, I need to talk to somebody from inside of the business. I went to Cargill, the company, that American company there. When I went to interview, to, to have an interview with them, they have two guys filming me during the whole time. So they were actually filming me. And it was a little bit spooky and during the whole process. So I tried to film this guy before, but he, 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 he the first time he was not there, I think he was not want to talk to me. So I, one of the, my way backs to the, to the region, I said, let's try to take a, take a, take a chance. I take a look, see what he if he's there. And he was. So he, during the conversation, he was very angry with me. Um, and what he does represents is the mentality of how people think about the region. I think to answer your question, uh, the mentality, the way of he, he thinks about the region when he mentioned the other clip, they said there is only, you know, forest, jungle, jungle. There is nothing here. So that's the way the mentality behind what these people are thinking. They see the forest not as an asset. They see it as only as through the lens of expropriation to the uh, to take something, to use that as a supply, nothing else. So I interview him as you saw. He was there is a moment that he's. He's so red, he's so like angry. And, and then there is a moment there um, during the interview that I, I, I was, I mean, I try not to show that I was intimidated. I keep my compo composure compo there. And, but then he, he, he looked at me and he was kind of like, I'm gonna say, you know, straight and, and curto gross in Portuguese, he said, very straightforward. And, and, and then I, I keep asking questions for him, but um, he has been responsible for a big deforestation and he was actually condemned by the justice there. Uh, he died a couple of years after the film. Um, I don't know if you watched the film or not um, because I, we exhibited the film in, in Belterra and in Fordlandia, but uh, he was, his, his family was, uh, you know, condemned by the federal prosecutors there because of the amount of land that he destroyed to plant soybean. He is part of a group of um, entrepreneurs that came from the south of Brazil, uh, moving little by little into the Amazon. So the mentality that he represents is the mentality that see the, the region as a commodity. commodity. So the, the Amazon for those, for them are commodity. So when you would see a region that way, um, we, we, we understand because another way of thinking this is that the Amazonia, it's a, it's a, is a teach us how to see the country. When you look to the Amazon, you can, by looking into the Amazon, we can mirror or you can understand the whole dynamic in place in Brazil. And I think his example, especially in the time that we are right now in 2021, he characterized exactly this prototype of mentality. Uh, just for you to have an idea, Brazil uh, just last year was has the highest um, number of exportation uh, uh, of soy in, in quite some time. Um, so the, the COVID put in place this 
dynamic that has been carried out for quite some time in Brazil, where the commodities of Brazil, in the case, the agribusiness, they feed the narrative of soybean or all the products that, I mean, last year we have the decrease in rice and beans, but you have an increase of soybean and other products that agribusiness control. So because the agribusiness ultimately determine what people are gonna eat. And that's, I think, I don't know if you understand where I'm going here, but this is gonna be even more complicated because what you see now, what he represents is that the agribusiness, which soybeans is one of the big, I would say top models, it's dictating the way people eat, the way people, you know, um, basically consume. So, and then you have a, a, a chain effect. I don't know if you follow me here. There is a chain effect of uh, processes in the region, which he encapsulates, which is the process where it's not only the soybean, it's all the derivatives, all the things that are coming in the same, um, I would say roots in the same token with the soybean. And for instance, the, 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 the government itself has been uh, supporting this, especially right now in Brazil, this whole narrative. So long story short, I mean, Sara, he is a prototype of the mentality in, in, in play right now in Brazil. And especially when the agribusiness has been dictating and controlling, and it's, it's really um, the driving economic force in Brazil right now. And, and that's become a, a, a huge implication for future generations because the soybean, as you, as you show there, there is so many damage that soybean causes for the region. For instance, the soybean that destroy the forest, they change completely the landscape. Mm -hmm. the, land, the soybean destroyed the, far, the, uh, the, the um, family farms, uh, local, local farmers, agricultural family, you know, and also they contaminate the groundwaters, which are bring cancer and you know, and also destroy the whole business, local business. So you see that this little, you know, seed over there has been provoking a huge transformation in the whole landscape yeah. of the Amazon. So the impact that this particular example that you the clip there, it's one. But that's very interesting that you picked that one because really they synthesize, you know, summarize a little bit of this process going on in the region right now. And I think that, I mean, like another thing that you do so well in this film is to tie the past to the present. Um, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about this connection that you're making between the rubber industry and soy production and maybe some of the similarities or differences in terms of labor requirements chemicals, mechanization, and this, you know, these, sure. these visions of Henry Ford and his like entrepreneurial or in innovative spirit. And soybean also sort of being this innovative agribusiness that has come from elsewhere, from Asia and the US to Brazil and having that same idea about what some of these different similarities and differences are. And well, maybe that could be our last question and we can have some audience participate. No, uh, that's wonderful. Later. Uh, well, I, I think there is a, um, between the rubber and the, um, it's, uh, I, I think it's very interesting, you know, because we can think about, for instance, from, um, even if, if you wanted to think about from sugar to the soy, if you can go back, digress a little bit, but because all these patterns, you know, I don't like to use much, Sarah, the idea of cycles because, but are we going to use here? In the Amazon, we have cycles. We have the, the cyclo, now cycle of, uh, let's say, la, la, la cacao, you know, cycle of la junta, uh, which is a little fiber that we can, side of like, for instance, the rubber. And then, but when it comes to the soybean, nobody knows much how to put frame now, 
what's the role of soy because it's still going on. We do not know for how long the soybeans are going to, you know, remain and last. But we know for sure when the soybean leaves the Amazon, the damage is already done. It's irreversible. And when Chicago, which determines the price of the soy in the market, when the stock of Chicago would fail, collapse, I mean, we're going to see a big trouble coming. So I think, Sarah, there is an interesting contrast that you, 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 you ask because the, the rubber different from the soy, the rubber, um, they still create some kind of relationship, um, relationship among the, the actors over there. What we see with the soybean is that they eliminates the relationships, the connections. So as I said before, so they, they eliminate in the jobs <laughs> because you have two people that doing the entire work, you know, for, you know, we have two tractors working and, and you have this amount of, I mean, people that lose the, the way of working as the Donald De Sigo said in the end of the film. I mean, you see that the, the whole, dynamic of the production of flour was altered, was changed because, because that there is no more opportunity, there is no more community relationship there. So I think one of the things that I would say that high, to highlight the contrast between the rubber and the soy is that there is a huge dynamic in, in, in operation functionality there. But we have to understand that Ford was such a visionary in that even at a particular time, he already saw soybean as a, a way looking for the future. But uh, the, the, the rubber, it's very interesting, Sarah, because when Ford arrived in Brazil in 1927, the boom of the rubber was already over. I mean, the, he, he, when he arrived, people said, what this guy is doing here? You know, because the, the rubber is already, you know, but he came with this brilliant idea to really was afraid. What he was behind his mentality there, Sarah, was the idea that he wants to control the whole line of production. He didn't want it to be dependent of anybody else. And that's a very interesting image to carry along with this. Because this idea of totalitarian, totalitarian idea that Ford carries says a lot to us nowadays. We see a lot of guys around there in the world nowadays who want to control everything, don't you? I mean, we have one less, less year in the election here, want to control everybody. So these same ideas that uh, these guys that wanted to control everything, to have dominion over everything. And what this is important, Sara, I think is important for us because when you look to to the rubber and you look to, to Ford, what Ford did, uh, I mean, he, for instance, what did Ford get this idea, Sarah, of controlling totalitarianism idea? I think for me, Sarah, I think he got this idea from the railroad system. But what he did there, when he go for West, where you are, I mean, so this whole railroad ideas there, he put on top of that, science and technology. So when Ford comes to the Amazon, he faced a big challenge. First of all, because the rubber was compromised, it has a big problem there because the blight, the blight was causing problems for the rubber. The rubber could not, you know, grow healthy. So he had a problem there. But why have a problem there, Sada? Because he did not want to understand that nature work in, in relationship. So he need to respect that the whole bioma, the whole relationship that the plant itself has with the environment around that. So I think that I'm trying to put images here to make us to think, Sarah, to think this image that the difference between soybean and, and the rubber, I think it has, I mean, it's that they are, feed in the same narrative, the narrative that they don't look to the surroundings, they don't look for the relationship, they don't look for how that they are altering the system, 
So because when soybean now, 2021, they destroy the whole bioma, the whole environment. And by environment here, I mean, Sarah, the whole relationship between humans and no humans. In the same way, when Ford was established the soybean, the rubber plantations, he didn't realize that he tried to create like a chain to plant soybean in a in a in a in a in a, in a kind of like a in a belt kind of you know model, you know, like the belt that you have all things come out of in sequence. And he realized nature doesn't function that way. I think Sarah that the, the connection between the soy and the rubber, I think it's it's not, a, I would say the result is that come to the same place, the destruction, where they do, they do not respect the surroundings, they do not respect what is in that location. For instance, when Ford came to the Amazon, he tried to change the way the, the local people live, eat, practice their culture. I mean, not only the, 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 the not only Sarah, the, the seed, the plant itself, he changed also the dynamic of how people interact and live in that, in that environment, in that place. But also the, the, the rubber was teaching him. So Ford, when he came to Brazil, Sarah, he, he brought all kinds of technology he kind of, he's a kind of Elon Musk from our time. You know, he wanted to conquer. He can conquer, he could do any, he can do it. That time he could do anything he wants. But he, he came to Brazil, sir, but he didn't bring a biologist. He bring all the, he didn't brought an expert to understand the relationship in that environment and, and that you can see. And when you see the soybean nowadays, 2020, the soybean seems not, they're very much interested in the profit, but they don't look to the surrounding. They don't look to the damage they are causing. Contaminated the groundwaters, contaminate, you know, destroying the landscape, the forest, um, because there is no more trees. They, I mean, it, it, like, it's gonna be inver, inver, irreversible. And I think the contrast between the rubber and the soy sire has the same, I would say, outcome in the end, which is destruction. And because of the lack of understanding that we cannot live alone, the same way that the, the rubber, the, the seed, the Brazilian, you know, seringa, you know, uh, the, the, the rubber could, the tree of rubber could not be alone because they're going to be face a lot of, you know, contamination and, and fungus. The same way, is, I think, could tell us that we need the environment, we need to be in relationship interaction. And I think what we see that is a completely change in dynamics that uh, those same kind of like both the, the, the rubber narrative as well as the soy produce into, into us, into, into the community in the Amazon in that particular case. Thank you so much for that conversation to both of you. We're going to move on now to some questions from uh, folks in our audience. Uh, and the first one is this. Almost every country that's gone from poor to wealthy has done it through industrialization. And industrialization has meant environmental degradation, at least to some extent, in all cases. Should we accept this process as inevitable for Brazil as well, at least if we're not willing to condemn Brazilians to poverty forever? Or is there a way for Brazil to grow rich without harming its environment? Wow, that's a wonderful, very interesting question. Uh, I would say that um, um, I, I think the path for social economics, uh, especially in the case of the Amazon, is the way to go. Uh, I would say that to find the balance between um, these predatory systems that has been placed there uh, in the Amazon um, and to find a way that we can, for instance, uh, live or in a respectful way is, is always the dream way, but it sometimes is very difficult to accomplish that specifically in the, in, the moment, in the moment like that that we are now, where we have a government which is financing or giving support for more destruction in the region. So um, 
we have to understand, um, uh, Chris, that uh, will will that all the backing digress a little bit. All the how do we get here? Number one. So I think to answer your your question is, I ask by answering a question, asking a question is how do we get here? We get here because we decide to. It. When I said me, I mean Brazil government. I mean get to the point where we are because we choose commodities. We choose instead of, you know, more dependable ways of relationship with the environment. So just for you to understand the commodity system that we have in place in Brazil, they see the region only as a supply, okay? So, but we have to understand that with the commodities idea or vision, I'm mean, using commodity here, not only as, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a, a fact, but also as a symbol, a symbolic, because the commodity is what come along with that, it's expropriation, it's destruction. Because when you look to a community, look to a place, anywhere, only as a commodity, and the, with the commodities comes destruction, comes death. Because the commodities look to the profit. They don't look to what the most important thing, which is life. So uh, your question leads me to, to, to think about this because the ideal situation right now is to create a sustainable way where communities that need right now to have a way of living and, and they can they're, be capable to, to have their own way of surviving, living. We have like several projects that I, I should mention, extractivistas. The women extractivists, they do our arts. They, they, they work with, for instance, they produce like different kinds of like products. They are, for instance, Castanha, they are exporting there. There is like very important work doing by the FASA, FASI, because it's, it's a very important organization that works with the local communities, riparian communities, and try to use, to take the products, local ones, and sell them overseas, giving them a very good profit for them. So we have different, um, I would say, uh, different kind of like, um, um, projects that has been trying to help the community to create their own way, sustainable way to live in a socioeconomic way, ideal thing. But the challenge is for us is how can we um, create this sustainable and I uh, would socioeconomic diverse. There is a lot of people that have been criticizing because they're, oh, we cannot have, um, development or progress in the Amazon, because if you have that, uh, we're going to destroy the, uh, the current way of living of some communities. And th this, this showdown between that. But I think there is a way, uh, I think, I, 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 that's one way I, that I would say that there is a possibility that thinking more, uh, I would say, more sustainable, more a way that we, the communities and you know, investment could be done. But that has to be very careful because what we have been seeing the Amazon right now in many instances, for instance, as I mentioned in the film, is that there is a law called Kandi law. Kandi law was a law uh, based in 1994, which for instance, no, no one, uh, for instance, are charged, can, pay a tax for anything they took from the Amazon. For instance, Will, um, if I go to your house, you invite me to go to your house and I open your refrigerator and take everything in the refrigerator and you know, you're gonna be upset with me because I take everything, but I don't pay you anything. So this particular law in the Amazon, they, they say that any resources that are taken out from the Amazon, they don't pay a taxes. So when you think about this, how is that possible that there is a law in Brazil that says that any resources taken out of the Amazon, like you see the soybean industry, you see the mining, you see, uh, if you have an idea how much, I mean, like for instance, bauxite or any kind of minerals they are removing daily from the Amazon and you don't pay any tax for it. So that's a pretty, um, um, it's pretty outrageous. 
And then how can we create a sustainable and balanced socioeconomic for this community? So this is the big, um, the big challenge that we have right now. There is ways that we can achieve that. I would say yes. I don't know if I'm going to be able to give you one precise answer because the question that you pause pose that for me, it's a very interesting question because that's the big challenge that we have right now. How to find alternative way? There is different projects. There is different kind of, um, I would say, um, uh, events that has been opposed even for previous governments and which was more favorable towards communities that try to develop. I remember very vividly Marina Silva when she was Minister of Environment, she really developed uh, different projects that was trying to create uh, this socioeconomic dynamics between the communities, try investment to the communities, try to invest, make this company invest in local, in the local uh, family farms, in the local creativities, uh, and different ways that people, local people can have a way of surviving. Because the Amazon itself is so huge, it's so big, and there is no kind of a silver bullet. There is not one thing that is going to save, solve all the problems in the Amazon. So the idea that we have a silver bullet, oh, miracle, it's complicated because we're talking about a diverse environment where we have um, not one Amazonia in the plural, in the singular, but Amazonias in the plural. So this concept is already changed. You see that I'm talking about a very, 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 um, uh, I would say, multifaceted environment. And, and we have to adapt some laws, some projects that work in Pará doesn't gonna work in Amapá, doesn't gonna work in the Amazonia, doesn't, Amazon state, doesn't gonna work in the Acre. So it's, it's different environment, different you know, circumstances. And, but there is, we need to find common ground in order to bring this, um, I would say, uh, socioeconomic sustainability to the local people there. I don't know if I answer, but I just, I try my best. All right, um, next question is, um, Lula and Dilma's governments were sensitive to many social issues, but it is definitely the case that the growth of the soy agribusiness occurred under them. Bolsonaro, of course, supports it. Can you imagine a change of route after the 2022 elections? Do you think that if there, it, do you think that if there is a return to power of the PT, they might reconsider their defense of the agribusiness model. Whoa, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, if you, everyone here today, this morning, watch the, in the summit, Bolsonaro, you know, when he was speaking, um, everything that he mentioned there was, was a lie. Yeah. So um, basically, um, what Bolsonaro did throughout the, the time that was given to him was begging for money from foreign powers uh, and begging for money for, to fulfill an agenda that, that he claimed that was belongs to him, but was be, exist there before him. So, and all the, the, all the I would say, All, all the advancement that the environmental issues had in Brazil um, prior to Bolsonaro, that Bolsonaro now is trying to destroy, has been right now being, um, being challenged. Because number one, there is a, a minister of environment that is against the environment. I think it's the only, the only place in the world that we see that a minister of environment in the, that is against the environment. But also, Chris, I think there is another aspect that we have to consider that um, sometimes uh, dictators, they always say what they're going to do, but nobody believes. <laughs> so they always say what they're gonna do it. Um, I think from the very beginning for the government, Bolsonaro government, he has been saying that he's gonna, not gonna give one millimeter of indigenous rights uh, for, for, their, for their land's rights. He has been attacking 
um, I mean, the indigenous communities in the Amazon in so many ways. I don't know if you guys know, but during the pandemic, the government of Pará considered the mining as essential workers. Think about that. I mean, they considered during the pandemic, the mining, because I don't know if you know, the mining, people during the pandemic in Brazil did not have much job work to do, but the mining industries continued to hiring people during the pandemic. And the government of Pará considered the mining, you know, as essential, it's bizarre as, as you can imagine. But more than that, Chris, I believe that what we, we experience here, uh, it's something unprecedented in Brazil. In which way is unprecedented? We have a minister of environment doesn't like, he doesn't want to protect the environment. He has been destroyed all the agencies that supposed to be protect the environment. The Obama, I mean, the SMBU and all the agencies that are supposed to be there to protect the environment. Just recently, the, the the Police Federal, which called equivalent to, I don't know, United States Police Federal is going to be the FBI, maybe. I don't know if it's too much. Uh, the, 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 the director of Police Federal in Manaus, he, he was fired because he was trying to put in place some policies to protect the environment. So um, if you ask me if, the, if I see any changes, yes, I do feel that after 2022, if you get lucky, I mean, to remove him from power, we might gonna have some changes. But um, I used to say, because I have to tie up this with Ford, when Ford was in, in the Amazon, he did, he make a big destruction in the region. I think this, his legacy of destruction is still right now in place in, many, in different ways. Uh, which ways they are in place through the soybean industry, through the cattle industry, to the mining business. So the, the dynamic change, but the operation, which I call the for land and matrix is still in place. But also it's important to know, Chris, that when, when you look to this, to this 2022, I mean, you think, well, it's a lot of destruction already done. Only for, you have more than 2,000 miner, miners only in the Yanomami land. But in the time of Ford, also was a lot of destruction. But the Amazon, the rainforest, they, they survived. What I wanted to say to you is that the, the rainforest will survive Bolsonaro. It's gonna be a lot of damage, but they will survive. Um, and what Bolsonaro wants to accomplish, his, his policies is to destroy. It's to destroy everything to build something else later, but nobody knows when this later could be. And that's the big trick here. And, but I do think there will be a change um, eventually. Um, we need to rebuild that. Um, we hope that um, the government here, Biden do not give, do not trust, do not believe that Bolsonaro will uh, become this, this lamb from day to night um, because that's not gonna happen. Um, because his policies, uh, it's, it's a destruction policies. And, and I was listening throughout the day, a lot of the things about his speech, when he claimed that he did such and such, he's gonna invest, he's gonna give more, he's gonna cut, you know, the car, car, carbs, uh, I think for, for uh, 2050 to 2030, something like that. Um, there is a lot of, talk a lot of blah blah in terms of what he said effectively he what he presents today it's something in from another realm another reality he seems completely disconnected from what is really brazil and the amazon is facing in this particular moment and then i think that just to finish 
I, I, I do think I do think we need a change. I think Bolsonaro has been carrying out his agenda in the Amazon with this minister. Just today we have, you know, I don't know how to say tuitasso. It's everybody in the tweet claim for, uh, we call tuitasso in Portuguese. It's a, you know, a camp, you know, try to um, uh, remove this um, Minister of Environmental, Roberto uh, Ricardo Salles. Get, he's, he's just uh, being, being extremely, um, uh, there is no word to describe how, if you have any other example of a person so destructive as he has been to the environment in Brazil. But yes, to, I, we expect the change. Um, it's not going to be easy. But first, to get to the change, we need to, to remove him. And it's going to be a big battle because the situation in Brazil right now, it's, it's, uh, it's, in, it's in, in, in a very difficult moment. We're gonna. We're almost at our final moments here, and I just want to make sure that the uh, fellows have a have a, a second to to thank sure. you. And no, uh, I am so thankful for everything that you're saying here. But I know we have a six sure. o'clock sure. end time, so um, I don't know, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thank you so much, Dr. Colon, and to all the audience members who were unable to uh, ask have the questions asked. Um, please feel free to reach out to him, Dr. Cologne, and the film is also available for viewing online. On behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. A special thanks to Dr. Cologne and to all those who sent in questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual ATH event, which will be on Monday, April 26th at 5 p.m. Pacific. Philosophy professor Valerie Tiberius will discuss the problem of conflicting goals through a philosophical lens. Thank you and have a good evening.